Um, this is Jerry Zion, the Global Training Manager here at Fluke Biomedical. Um, a lot of you know me, and um, now um, my good friend Justin Ross is uh, going to introduce himself. Hello, I'm Justin Ross. I am the Fluke Biomedical Rep for Pennsylvania, New York City, and New Jersey. Uh, and I've been a CBT in the field for about 17 years prior to joining the Fluke team. So I uh, fell over and served as one of our product experts as well. All right. Well, let's get started. We uh, we're going to cover today um, some topics that are going to be of interest to you, and there's a lot more depth under each one of these. So the first one is why do we need to do testing uh, on ESU? Why that matters? We're going to talk a little bit and touch on what are the global testing standards um, that are uh, applicable, and to whom are they applicable, and then how does that how do those requirements actually affect you? And then the top 10 electrosurgery testing tips that we have for you, some things that are going to be helpful to you to remember as you go out to do your electrosurgery unit testing. Let's start with the basics. So electrosurgery unit, though the intended use of this device, which is made up of an electrosurgery unit generator, and then a variety of surgical instruments that connect to it to allow the surgeon to do a couple of things, to cut through tissue and to control bleeding. So the current is going to, we're going to cause current to flow through the patient. So this is a therapy device. The therapy that we're, we're providing is the means by which we can cut tissue, remove tissue, coagulate, bleeding blood vessels. Current has to flow. So whenever we have current flow, there's a risk to the patient. So we have to manage that. So the current is delivered through the surgical instruments, through a set of cables, and the, and the patient has uh, a, usually a patient dispersive pad that they are, that's it, uh, affixed to them. Or else in bipolar mode, we have the return electrode on the opposite side of the surgical instrument itself. So that there is a complete path for the current to flow, and it flows only through the path that we want it to flow, and not through any other alternative path in a way that would cause the risk to the patient, right? So we're going to introduce current to the patient, and we're going to do our very best to control where that current goes all the way back. So it goes all the way back to its source, the generator, safely. That's what we're going to do. And here's some modes of operation. So monopolar mode is a mode where we need that dispersive pad, the paper return plate, um, because if you think about the surgical handpiece. There's a little blade usually on that handpiece, and um, that blade is a very small surface area, okay? I mean, pencil tip almost. And so the, the current that's going to flow through that very small surface area is going to be, is going to cause a lot of heat to happen in order to get through that small surface area and into the tissue of the patient. We don't, and so it's gonna burn, all right? So it's going to heat up and it's gonna cause the ability to cut, which destroys the tissue that we're touching, or to coagulate tissue if we're in coag mode. When it comes back out of the patient, however, we don't want a high, a high heat so what we need is a larger surface area, and that's what the return pad provides, the larger surface area. And so then we are much more likely to have uh, less of a risk to the patient relative to burns, unless some things happen, and we'll talk about those in a minute. In the bipolar mode, we have usually we're using forceps or scissors or something like that. and um, the active electrode is on one side of that surgical instrument, and the uh, return path is on the other on the other side of that same surgical instrument. 
So we're trying to keep the current flowing only through the tissue we're actually going to touch and have it return all or most of it back to the electrosurgery unit generator, its source, right, right there. So in really good tight control. However, some, the current electrical current is kind of fun. It, it will follow what it thinks the path of least resistance is back to its source. And if it can't find, it, it will try and find any path that it can flow through. So sometimes if we don't have a adequate dispersive pad, it will try and follow a path through the ECG electrodes or through other metal um, that the patient is wearing or things like that. So sometimes the use of a dispersive pad is used, uh, it is um, used during bipolar surgeries as well. So bipolar surgeries examples are any endoscopic surgery, any laparoscopic surgery, if you've heard those two terms, you can be sure bipolar ESU is probably being used. All right, so now let's talk about cut and coag. This is part of, for sure, part of uh, monopolar energy, but it can be used in bipolar now too. So if we're just cutting, we're just going to cut through tissue, we would use a, a blended mode called pure cut. So there's nothing to blend here, it's just cut. The illustration shows the narrow, um, shows the high frequency and low voltage um, wave shape uh, on the left-hand side of this slide. Blended cut gives a wider incision and a lower frequency, but a little bit higher energy than pure cut. And it gives us the ability to do kind of both things in one, in, in one action. So it depends, the surgeon is the one who decides what they need to do and how they need to use this tool. Coag, coagulation, is where we're generating the heat um, to uh, not vaporize the... the it's not, uh, it's just continuously bleeding, 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 bleeding. Coagulate. So the wave shape looks a little bit different here. I was trying to see. No, I offed it. Uh, somebody is somebody is on. You, if you could please mute mute your microphone. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So. The coagulation wave shape looks a little bit different, and there's a pause in between each each application of the of the energy to allow the blood to kind of uh, to to clot, so that we can use it to stop minor bleeding. So uh, bleeding, um, just kind of oozy bleeding or things like that. So that's what we use coag for. This is kind of pretty high level. So, all right, so what can go wrong? So burns, typically, but there's different kinds of burns. And the worst kind would be a surgical fire that's caused because we had oxygen build up underneath the surgical drapes. And somehow we got a spark, let's say from a coag mode that ignited the oxygen that's built up underneath the drapes. That's really, really bad, bad for the patient. There's going to be injury. There could be death. So it's really, really important. It's the surgical team in the OR at the time that needs to help manage that. The anesthesiologist and the nurses and the surgeon need to help manage that to make sure they don't have that happen. There are burns that are due to reduced dispersive pad contact with the skin. So during the surgery, it's not unusual to need to reposition the patient in order to get better access to the site of the surgery. And when that happens, dispersive pads can pull away. So it, it, we need some safety things built in. We're going to talk about one really important, very basic safety thing that, um, that, that's really critical to always be sure that we're testing during our preventive maintenance and periodic uh, inspections. We have burns to inappropriate placement of the patient dispersive pad. 
that's also managed by the surgical team, not by us, burns to the test operator. That's you, okay? That's you. Can you be burned? Yep, you sure can. And one of the things that has bothered me from the very beginning, my very beginning as a biomed, was that we were improvising test connections because we didn't really have any better way to make the connection. Well, that's all going to change with what we're going to show you today and what you, uh, what you should learn about how to make proper state connections. So when you're doing the testing, you don't have the possibility of burning yourself because you were trying to clip an alligator clip to that single patient use disposable hand piece blade use it. That's one really big reason why operators, the people like you and me, will get burnt. So we're going to say no improvised connections. We're going to show you how to do that. And then, yeah. Yeah. another thing that we used to have to deal with all the time is when you're trying to test a unit, you didn't have all the parts and pieces. You might not have a hand piece or have a foot piece to use as an activation. So you're trying to use a piece of wire to jump it across and activate the ESU. Oh yeah, uh, doing out doing demos even today. I still see that see that happen a lot. Right. So we're going to help you take care of that and be safe, and still get your measurements done and and make sure that that medical device is safe and effective for clinical use. Then we have electrical safety and mac, uh, microshock from either low frequency uh, 120 uh, volts, 60 hertz, or 50 hertz if you're outside the U.S. Um, leakage current or high frequency leakage current. So there's some specifics about that that we want you to understand as well. All right, well, where does the requirement for testing come from in the first place? There are global or international standards about uh, electrosurgery units that come, that are managed under the IEC. And this is under the big umbrella IEC 60601. Certainly, low frequency electrical safety is managed under IEC 60601 1, and there are separate, uh, or under IEC 6353, and there are separate webinars specifically about that. So, we're not going to go into big detail about it here. But the typical ones that, that the manufacturer has to use in order to satisfy the US FDA, for example, if they're going to sell their product in the United States is the IEC 61289-2, 1994, or the 60601-2-2, which is 2006. And both of these are what govern um, the medical device design validation, the final assembly test uh, that the manufacturer has to do before they ship that ESU to you. And then you should be doing incoming inspections to make sure that what you paid for is what you got and that it meets its specifications before you put it into clinical use. So there's more about um, how, to, how to set up your medical equipment management plan to help take care of things like incoming inspection and separate webinars. All right, let's get into the 10 tips for ESU preventive maintenance and risk mitigation. Test tip number one, always refer to and follow the manufacturer's service manual test procedure. Dustin, what do you have to say about this one? Well, uh, with the service manuals, you might see more testing than what you would typically do. Um, when I first started in the field, um, when we were testing the issues, you go out to the know or you'd see a sticker on it would have five or six energy outputs at different levels of resistance, and that's all you did. And we tended to miss the high frequency leakage testing as well as the REM test. And uh, speaking from a personal net, uh, manner, the test most important to me is that CQM or contact quality monitor, or as we might know better, REM test. So I wanna make sure I'm only burnt in one spot, not two. So when we get to the manufacturer's service, please take the time and go through that service manual and make sure that you're actually testing all the parameters that they recommend for your device. Yeah, and we do need to comment that there are some electrosurgery manufacturers who want you to go through their service school before they'll provide that information to you. Irby is one of them. So if you run into that, just be sure that in your purchase requirement, purchase order requirements, 
you add in that one copy of the service manual must be provided at the time of delivery of the product. Um, we did that and that was very effective, but we also scheduled, budgeted, scheduled, and went to those um, trainings that the ESU manufacturer or any other medical device manufacturer offered, even though they cost some money and travel to get there, to make sure that we were doing everything we were supposed to do in the way that we were supposed to do them. So be sure that you're following that service manual procedure. And that's also gonna give you a recommendation as to another tip that we're gonna give you in a few minutes. Right here, adopt a consistent inspection frequency. Your frequency of inspection should be at least, and I say least, what the manufacturer recommends in the service manual test procedure. In, in one case, in the newer Valley Labs, they have now reduced that to once per year. But we have always traditionally been doing the inspections and the testing on ESUs twice per year. And that has helped go a long way to reduce those things that we can control as biomed, uh, biomed and healthcare te technology management professionals. Uh, about that ESU. We can't control the surgical team in the actual operating field, but, uh, but we can uh, do a thorough job of testing. So um, make sure that you're adopting at least what the manufacturer is recommending for the inspection frequency. And ideally for ESUs, they're such a high risk to the patient for injury, we really ought to be doing them for sure twice a year. Justin, do you have any advice about that or what are you running into? Um, you know, times have changed and there's more and more devices out in the market than what there was 10, 15, even 20 years ago. And we're seeing more specialty devices, more specialty devices. And we're seeing them uh, being controlled differently. We see a lot of these piezo control devices and some of them even recommend no bill checks or procedures at all. And uh, personally speaking, I have a hard time with that because there's always that one chance where something catastrophic happens and it's not caught in a daily, daily routine. You know, every technician has that one story. So having my family, having the potential of my family being a patient, regardless of what the main, you know, make sure we go the way through all the steps. So this weighted score is a great double check uh, to see where you should actually be servicing it. By the way, this, what we're showing you on this page is coming from, is something that the University of Vermont Biomed Department is using. It's part of our medical device quality assurance uh, course series and book uh, from the University of Vermont. So uh, be sure that you're going into the Advantage training and, and, um, and taking those, uh, those course series as well, to understand exactly how to fill this out. It's a risk-based assessment. So you're always gonna have the patients the idea in mind to reduce the risk of injury to the patient uh, when you're filling this out. It's really, really good to assess that and what's going on in your facility compared to anybody else. Tip three, understand what is high frequency current and how it, it's weird. It's just way different than regular old run of the mill 120 volt, 60 hertz or 240 volt, 50 hertz current flow. And you really need to understand it. And, and that's why we offer more kinds of training about uh, what is it and, and what you can do, how you can make yourself safe. If you really don't understand it, I suggest that you try and do all of the training you can find, not only ours, but anything else. Make sure you understand it before you go out and try and do ESU testing. Really important. And oh, by the way, we have more than one application note, and now this brand new one that we just posted to uh, this week about uh, how to safely use Fluke Biomedical QAES-3 when you're doing high-frequency ESU testing. I've just read through this paper, and there's things I did not know. I mean, this is a great paper to review. Uh, if you're the new tech, you've been in the field for years, take a few seconds and read through uh, They're great information. Tip number four, safety first. As I said, no improvised test lead connections 
At least when you're using our test equipment, you should have no reason to have to do this. Uh, we provide all of what you need. And by the way, the, the we have a question on We do have a question, right? The question is, of these two pictures that you see on this slide, which one is the safe way to do this test? The number one or the number two? And please type that into chat. We'll give you a minute here or so to fill in your, what you think. Number one or number two being the safe way? see some responses in the chat. So, so far we see lots of numbers, number, number twos. All right. Number two, number two. Anyone voting for one? No? Everyone knows their job. I'm <laughs> proud of y'all. Okay, well, let's just see what we said. We said number two. Yay. Good job. Absolutely good job. If I had uh, bongo bucks to give out, boy, I'd be giving them out to everybody <laughs> who had it too. So you did good. You did good. All right, test tip number five. Complete all of the tests that are necessary to ensure performance of the brand and model of ESU that you need to test. So that includes, includes the CQM, which is the contact quality mo uh, monitor, in Valley Lab terms, that's called REM, R-E-M. In other terms, it's called R-E-C-M. There's another terminology out there for it too, but it is defined in the standards as a monitor. It is that patient return watchdog that's looking at the resistance of that patient return pad, that dispersive pad, to make sure that it is sufficiently con in contact with the patient. And when it's not, then what has to happen is the ESU output energy needs to be cut off and you need to see a visual and hear an audible alarm. And that's what you're looking for. So there's specific instructions about how to do that test in the manufacturer's service procedure. And that does vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. You know, it's pretty standard, but there are a few out there that you will test almost in reverse order and it does have an impact. I think the other term you're looking for is ARM, A-R-M. Right. So, yes. So, uh, do, it, it is important to, to know the ESU that you're testing because the instructions about how to do this test depend on the design of that ESU and its return quality monitor. So, power output tests for monopolar and bipolar cut and coag modes, all blended modes, you need to be looking at those and tracking them and looking for trend deviations over time. Vessel ceiling functionality, if the ESU includes it, you need to test it. You need to verify it uh, in accordance with how the manufacturer tells you to do it because once again, it is dependent on how the design of that functionality exists in the brand and model of ESU that you're testing. Not everyone is exactly the same. So that's why you need that service manual procedure and you need to understand the ESU. High frequency leakage tests. So in the high frequency, especially frequencies above one megahertz, so they become like radio frequency and all of your test leads suddenly turn into antennas. And there's a lot of more weird things that happen. We need to test high frequency leakage current for all ESUs to make sure that we see how much risk the patient is at for microshock, even at high frequency. The test limits in high frequency leakage are higher than they are for low frequency leakage current that you would test with an electrical safety analyzer. The high frequency uh, uh, leakage is tested using the ESU analyzer. Inert gas. So some ESUs have argon envelopes that are generated around the site of the surgery. And those are there to eliminate or, or push out oxygen. Because if we have pushed up oxygen out of the picture around where the site of the surgery is, we reduce oxidation. And that means less charring, 
Less charring means a cleaner, more precise cut. And that more precise cut means faster healing. So um, it's really important that we're that we're gonna that we test what is the exact flow and pressure of that uh, argon envelope production. That's a little bit specialized. You might have to, in that case, you might have to improvise a gas flow measurement uh, connection. All right. So, uh, and by the way, you need a different test instrument. Hey, Jerry, you might want to mention there that when we're doing these outputs, our, our, our output tests, not just to check the one channel, but make sure we check all channels. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. One more, and then I have another quiz question for you. Um, power distribution tests. So why is this important? Well, where uh, the ESU includes any kind of tissue uh, density or, or uh, tissue resistance measurement, you need to understand how that, how that functionality is working or if it is working. In a regular ESU that does not have any monitoring of tissue resistance, what will happen is as the load value increases, the output current and energy will reduce, it will fall off. So the only way you get to see that is if you have appropriate loads and you test the output energy. Usually this is done at maximum power setting on the ESU but over across a series of different loads. And then you can really see whether that uh, tissue function, uh, sensing functionality is working or not working based on the output from the ESU. And those that do that, that do have that tissue capability, resistance capability, you'll see a more flat response, which is, uh, which is really good. So you probably are gonna have to plot your measurements yourself though, in order to see that. So be prepared to do that because it really is important to have a look at that. You're only looking at once or twice a year. You really ought to be looking at them thoroughly if that's all you're going to evaluate. All right, here's your question. These are, there are a lot of tests here and some of them you do with the ESU analyzer and others you do something else with. So what instrument do you use to assess argon flow and pressure measurement? A, B, or C? And again, please type your response into the chat. We get a lot of Bs. B, 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 B. Lots of answer B. Right. I'll have a few A's here. Oh, there. really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, you can't test this one with the electrosurgery analyzer. There's option number three, which is great because mm -hmm. this is what we're here for. We're mm -hmm. here to clarify everything and let you guys know more. Well, let's see what the real answer is. It is B. It is B. And we're going to show you an example of a really great tool to be able to use to get that done. All right. Good on all of you that had picked a B. Excellent. That means you're really learning and you're, and you're knowing what you need to know. I'm proud of you. All right, so when we think about all of the kinds of tests that need to be done and all of the information that we need to be able to, to see from the ESU, we have low frequency electrical safety leakage current testing. We need an electrical safety analyzer for that. We have the ESU analyzer itself to make the measurements around output power, power distribution, high frequency leakage and CQM for sure. And then we have the gas flow analyzer to be able to evaluate any, when, it, when it's included in the ESU, we can look at that argon gas flow and pressure to make sure that part is, is working as well. And when we look at the power output, it's not, it's not only important to look at the numeric value, but it's important to look at the wave shape. And the way you get that is, by connecting an oscilloscope. And we have a wonderful oscilloscope that lets you zero right in very, very quickly on the right triggering to get on screen, what does that output energy look like? So you remember in the first 
uh, in the output energy slide, we're showing you what does that wave shape look like. That's what you want to be able to see. We can only do that with an oscilloscope. There isn't any tool that's better than that for showing you that information. And it's also going to give you the ability to make some measurements about that. So in any case, um, the, uh, for us, that would be the scope, uh, the 190M scope meter, one of the uses. And um, the uh, VT900A would be perfect for the measurement of the argon envelope. And of course, the appropriate electrical safety analyzer that's, uh, that you're gonna wanna use for this and all the rest of your electrical safety testing. So in the USA, that might be the ESA 614. Outside the US, maybe the, the uh, ESA 615 will be appropriate for you and for the international standards you need to be able to adhere to. Should also mention that a uh, scope meter will connect very easily to the back of the QES3. Oh yes, There's no additional ports. You just connect right into the uh, oscilloscope port and back the QES3, and you're off and running. Outstanding, outstanding. All right. So tip number seven: we need to uh, properly uh, archive, uh, uh, collect our our measurements in an easy way, so that we can archive them, which will be the next. The, the next tip, but in this case, we have a functionality in QAES3 called autosave that will let you speed. Once you turn on autosave, um, and there's a step-by-step -step procedure that we'll cover in a different place that uh, lets you make your measurements. The test lead connections are a little bit more complicated because we will add in a switch in, that's inside the QAES3 that lets you control and energize the ESU with the one, with one button touch uh, for your test measurement on QAES3. So you're not only going to start your measurement, but you're also going to energize the ESU in order to get the values. And those will be auto-saved when you do it that way. So there's much more to follow on this. Um, we have covered the subject in one or one or another of our videos about using QAES3 to do testing on ESUs. And I encourage you to go and view those videos. Better yet, to go in and, um, and do the advantage training course on intro to using QAES3, which we have dropped all of these newest video content and everything into. So if you took it before and it wasn't there, go back, take it again, earn another certificate of completion. All of those are, uh, all of those certificates are valuable to you if you are trying to maintain your CBET certification through ACI. So auto saves a really nice feature in case you ever have a patient incident, and then it's uh, you can call the exact figures into it. There is no handwriting. There's no chance of you know accidentally writing a nine instead of a four or a seven. That's all eliminated with the auto save feature. Excellent point. All right, and of course archive those test results one way or another. Um, there are ways to do that, several different ways, uh, including uh, manual documentation and saving them in the way, whatever way you're doing it right now. But there are also other ways. And so we'll talk about those in a different uh, webinar because there are a lot more detail to go into that that we don't have time to go into today. But that archival includes that those kinds of measurements that Justin was just talking about, especially around your investigation of patient incidents that will have been reported to the US FDA uh, because that's a requirement under the law here in the United States, or they may have been reported and complained about by um, in other ways. It is a medical legal thing when you get into that. So you're helping the risk manager of the hospital reduce the amount of uh, money paid out to settle lawsuits because electrosurgery burns and scars that shouldn't be there are all very, very expensive. And I don't know about you, but I like my paycheck. So if you like your paycheck, this is part of how you help make sure you always get a good paycheck. Tip number nine is... <laughs> Favorite. <laughs> uh, 
Return. Oh, yes, oh, my favorite too. <laughs> So has this ever happened to you? You just get done with uh, uh, testing a device, including an ESU, and you took it back up to the clinical unit and the next surgery started and you got an immediate phone call and it said, what the heck did you do to this, to this ESU? Because it sure is it's not set where we expect it to be set. Just think about that. If you felt, if you've experienced that, you know, how that feels i got caught up because it was broken because i accidentally shut the power switch on the back off and they're used to just plugging it in yeah yeah so uh, you can you can not have a lot of these things happen to you by just doing one simple thing before you even start your testing write down what the settings are on that esu or any other medical device you're going to deal with and then before you take it back to the clinical unit return those settings to their the value they were set at when you got it. Very simple thing to do, takes you an extra maybe five minutes or less. You know what? You're gonna reduce the number of call outs that you get that are really uh, problem not found. Well, there is a problem here, it was your fault, yeah. It was a self-injected problem, but it will reduce those kinds of things. And you know what? It's going to add confidence in, from that clinical unit in you and your department as biomed. They will feel like you know what you're doing when you take these actions. So my, my experience recommendation to you is follow this tip. Absolutely. Okay. And tip number 10, you can download our free ESU white papers and app notes. You want to do that today. So you will go to our website to the uh, Knowledge Center tab. You can follow the, uh, the uh, URL at the bottom of the app note uh, of this slide. But basically, it's under the Knowledge Center application notes. And then you just uh, search on ESU. And you will find all of these app notes and you can download them and read them at your leisure. And we really strongly recommend you do that. If you go into advantage training to take the training courses in there about ESU, these application notes are included as reference documents in the, the appropriate courses. All right, that's what I have for the 10 steps, the 10 tips that we have for you about electrosurgery unit testing. We hope that, I mean, y'all, I'm very proud of this. This is a great audience. You guys you, and gals, you did, you really know more than a lot of the audiences that we do this presentation at. So pat yourself on the back, stay current because medical device manufacturers innovate and they add new great things that are driven by clinical need. They are wonderful, wonderful uh, additions and functionality, but those innovations are ahead of the standards by three to five years. And guess what? They're ahead of most of the test instrument manufacturers also. So if you want someone you can trust who's really got our mindset for helping you protect those patients that your hospital serves, think about trusting us. <laughs> And by the way, our, our Vantage Training Center is available for you. You need to register for this because we save all of your certificates of completion and hold them there for you. So you can always get to them and yours are separate from everybody else's. So we password protect them and username protect them just for that purpose. But you will find more training than you, and, and it's all organized in one place. There's a lot of other places we put the stuff, but find it organized quickly there. <laughs>